Hello, everyone. My name is Da Qingguo, a full professor from the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. It's my great pleasure to host this IOP symposium, which is entitled as the Multi-Scale Modeling of Brain Dynamics and the Cognitive Process. As is well known, recent development in computational neuroscience offers us a very good approach to understand the theoretical basis of the high-efficient information processing in the brain. In this IOP symposium, we will focus on studies of brain dynamics at different levels, ranging from the microscopic level related to a single neuron dynamics to the macroscopic level of the dynamics of the whole brain. Today, we will have four speakers. The first speaker is Professor Chang Song Zhou, and he is from Hong Kong, and he will talk something about the dynamics of the large-scale resting brain networks. The second speaker is Professor Yuan Yuanmi, who is from Chongqing University, and the title of her talk is A Synaptic Story of Working Memory. The third speaker is Dr. Yunliang Zhang from the Blandis University, and he will talk about some mechanism on the axonal resilience to high frequency spiking at a single neuron level. The last speaker is Dr. Dongping Yang from the Chinese Academy of Science, and he will talk about the special temple dynamical modeling of Epsom seizures in the cortical thalamic system. Okay, let's start the first talk and welcome Professor Chang Song Zhou to give us the presentation. Hello, everyone. So I would like to thank uh, Professor Guo for the invitation to this IOP symposium. And I would like to take this uh, opportunity to share with you our recent work in characterizing uh, brain functional segregation, integration, and balance in the resting state brain networks and see how these uh, measures can support different cognitive abilities across individuals. So this work was done uh, by uh, my postdoc, uh, Ms. Wang, uh, Dr. Wang Long and uh, PhD student Mian Xing, and also in collaboration with uh, quantum neuroscientist, uh, Professor Hugh Tuck from, uh, uh, Hugh Brunted from uh, Germany. So here is a brief outline of my presentation. I will first give you some introduction about functional uh, segregation and integration in brain network. And then I will come to uh, introduce uh, the results based on eigen mode uh, analysis to review hierarchical module uh, organization in the functional connectivity. Then I will talk about the balance of segregation and integration. And finally, the prediction of uh, the cognitive ability across individual. So in our brain, we have uh, <clears throat> this uh, system to support different uh, functional processing like uh, visual processing auditory motor processing by different brain areas so we have a specialized brain system for different processing and this is called functional segregation but this specialized uh, processing need to be uh, integrated together to obtain like higher order cognition and then we need the integration so in the traditional neuron science, we treat the brain as different system, different brain areas, different functional subsystem for segregation and integration. But uh, in the last decades, we know that uh, they are very complex network interaction underlying these uh, brain areas, including the structural projection and uh, the functional uh, correlation of the brain activity and the called the functional connectivity and the structural connectivity. But then how we can, in principle, realize the so-called segregation and integration in the sense of a network, then this is related to the concept of uh, modules in the network. Suppose we have some brain areas and can form the so-called network module, means that the connection within the module is quite dense and the connection between the modules are sparser. Then 
the more you can do functional segregation because you can have a, like a fast, more frequent processing within the module, and then the module will not be too much interfered by the other modules. But in order to realize integration from such segregate modules, then we need the communication or interaction among the modules. So from this argument, then we would expect that uh, you would have modules and then the interaction among the modules to have both segregation and integration. Now let's go to the real brain connectivity to have a look. And you see the connectome structure in the brain for, of different species like a cat, monkey, human, are all categorized by this very pronounced module organization. And you can see for the same functional system, like here, visual system, and then the connection uh, among the brain areas of the same system is much denser than the connection between the different modules. So this is the module modular organization. And in the brain, we have different types of neurons, like excitatory and the inhibitory neurons, and then the interaction of these neurons will generate uh, dynamics. And then these different brain areas, due to this modular organization or coupling, will also show correlation in their dynamic. And that's the functional connectivity. So the functional connectivity can measure, for example, the correlation of the old signal. And then after you measure correlation, you can also do the analysis like a, a network, and then you can detect the modules and you can measure modularity. Then a higher modularity means you have denser connection within a module and the sparser connection uh, between module. And uh, then you can realize uh, higher segregation. And the integration can be measured by like some areas are linking to different modules, therefore can have a communication among different segregated systems for functional integration. So we have already observed in the previous work that if we human are doing tasks, then our functional connectivity, the network indeed will form some modules. And depending on different tasks, this module architecture are different in the functional network. So some tasks like a working memory, in back, may need the coordination of different brain system. Therefore, in principle, should require uh, uh, higher integration or smaller segregation. So indeed, you found that uh, across individuals, those people with higher, like a modularity, they will work worse for the impact. But some other tasks may require uh, stronger segregation or modularity for better performance. But this kind of a network measure basically pay attention to module at one level. But the brain network, actually, I will emphasize that uh, this module have many levels, actually. So we see a module, you can see smaller module and uh, <clears throat> form this hierarchical architecture. Now, what we are talking about so far is about brain network. But when we come to the behavior of our brain, and uh, there's also some hierarchical architecture in our like uh, uh, ability or intelligence. So we can do different tasks across individual people. Uh, uh, the performance in the task of some task can be correlated because these different tasks, for example, task one and the task two, could uh, reflect the underlying the same hidden ability, for example, the fluid ability or crystallized ability, memory, or response speed. And uh, these latent ability are relatively independent, but they are still correlated. And uh, on top of that, we have the so-called general intelligence, general ability. So you have uh, some larger project, like a, a, a human connectome project, and they use a, a larger uh, test battery to measure these different ability uh, in uh, of our human. Then there has been some hypothesis that uh, since our human um, being will need to do different tasks with different requirement of segregation integration. So therefore, in order to have a overall kind of a best performance, we in principle should have some balance of uh, segregation and the integration in our brain organization in the structure or uh, 
or functional interaction. But the, the question is that how we can properly like quantify and measure the segregation and integration and whether they, there is a balance or not. So the first step is to better quantify this segregation and integration. So therefore, the question we <clears throat> ask and try to answer uh, is uh, about segregation and integration in the functional uh, brain network, how to quantify uh, them properly. Is there a balance of segregation and integration? And whether indeed this segregation integration or the balance, um, the individual difference can predict our quantitative ability. So the method that we use to address this question is a combination of a, a dynamic co connective model together with uh, this functional ML data and uh, actually also structural connective data and the quantitative performance data. And uh, we use this uh, eigenmode, eigenvalue, uh, the compensation method, and also use uh, uh, statistical modeling, the structural equation modeling to link the brain measure with uh, the uh, <clears throat> behavior measure. So the model I mentioned is uh, a simple model to model the functional interaction between the brain areas because our brain dynamic is very complex. So in this model, I just use locally some noise to represent the local dynamic, but the, these models are coupled through the, the underlying uh, structural connectivity. And uh, there's a parameter C to control the interaction. So from a model, then when you couple this, uh, uh, we call Gaussian linear model through the spring network, then different brain areas will achieve correlation. And then this correlation is called functional connectivity it's from model, it's a model connectivity. And then we can compare this model connectivity at different coupling to the functional connectivity from the real uh, fMR data. Now, well, let me come to this uh, method that we propose called eigen mode in the functional connectivity, kind of a hierarchical or nested spectral uh, uh, part partition. So if we go to compute from a model or from a data, you for different brain areas, the correlation matrix, you get the so-called functional connectivity matrix. And this including the weight of the correlation, right? Now we go to do the eigen mode, eigen value decomposition. And then the first eigen factor you see has this property that all the component will have the same sign, positive or negative. And uh, this means this eigenfactor is uh, capturing like the whole brain or activated in the same way, in a uniform way. It's actually measuring the synchronization of the whole brain. Now, when we come to the second mode, and then we see we have a positive and a negative value. Now, if we group these uh, uh, brain areas with the same sign of a negative or positive, they organize this matrix. You see, we can see clearly now the same matrix after the organization will show these uh, two modules. And within the module, the connectivity is much stronger. And the connectivity between the module is sparser. Now we do this same thing, go to the next mode. And uh, you find again the positive and negative value and then group the areas according to this positive and negative. You see, again, you can organize this uh, even denser smaller modules. So we can go further and further to higher order modes of the eigenfactors. And then we finally divide the whole brain into like a separate brain areas. <clears throat> yeah. So we can, we can get this uh, uh, hierarchical architecture of the functional connectivity using this uh, 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 multi-level spectral uh, deposition. And uh, I said already the first mode means kind of a global synchronization. And then the second mode is segregation of the brain into two different parts. And the third one go to <coughs> smaller and smaller. So therefore we can call the first component as a, the integration of the whole brain. And then second and the third is a kind of segregation at different uh, levels. But it's important that the segregation is also uh, related to the integration within the mode within uh, uh, the module, right? So the eigenvalue can be considered as the contribution 
or, or energy of each of the components. So how strong is this sequence or how strong is the segregation? So we can use the eigenvalue and do some adjustment of how large is the size of the module. And then we define this so-called integration is from the first whole brain mode. And then the segregation is from the other segregate, segregated mode. And then I will show you like the difference later can be used as a measure of uh, the balance of the segregation and integration. Now let me come to this. Uh, for some reason, uh, the model was not shown properly. The, the Gaussian linear model I just showed you before. So in this model, I have this coupling parameter. Yeah, when the coupling C is very small, there's a very small correlation between the different brain areas. When you increase the coupling, the correlation increases. So this uh, black line here shows the average correlation <clears throat> from the model and uh, increasing with uh, the coupling. And at a certain special coupling value, we found that this model correlation become the same as uh, the real data here. The green one is from the real data, real ever model. And at this special coupling parameter, we can compare the correlation matrix from a model and from a data, and we found that they are most similar. So the distance between the two metrics are similar. And then if you if you look at the connectivity uh, uh, of the brain of the model and the, and they are very similar at this uh, point here. Now, since we have the measure of functional integration and the segregation, and then you can see how they change with uh, coupling. When we increase the coupling, this integration is getting stronger and stronger. The whole brain synchronization becomes stronger, but then the segregation here, the blue line, becomes smaller and smaller. And the very interesting thing is that the way we define these measures at this uh, special coupling, when you come to uh, have the same functional connectivity or very, very similar functional connectivity, then this measure of segregation and integration that uh, we get from the underlying structural network become equal. And the difference is uh, is zero from this uh, group average of the brain structural network. But if you go to measure the functional connectivity directly from the FMR data, this green line is also very close to zero. So from these results, we see that uh, in a normal, uh, healthy, young brain, on average, we have uh, the balance of segregation and integration. And here in this plot, I show you the modularity and this participation coefficient. You can see at this special coupling, there's uh, no signature of uh, something special. And then this measure seems not sensitive to the coupling. And later I will show you that they are not very good to predict the behavior of our brain. Now, so far I just talked about the, the group average, but the, actually every individual brain are different and the uh, individual brain shows different segregation and integration. Like here is one example of individual with a more segregated brain and here more integrated brain. But on average, most people are at the balanced state. And uh, for an individual, if on average your, your, your brain functional network is at the balance, then we can look at your temporal change of your brain states. And it shows that sometimes functional connectivity is stronger and uh, sometimes it's weak. And we found that, that actually the brain is switching between the segregated and the integrated state. So if our brain is at the balanced state close to zero, then you spend like almost half time in the balanced state, in, in the segregated and half time in the segregated state. And the transition between segregation and integration is the most flexible in such a, a, a balanced individuals. Now, after we characterize this uh, segregation, integration, and their balance, and also individual difference, now uh, we believe that, uh, as the hypothesis said, that uh, our brain state should prepare for the resting state, for should prepare for the switching to the task. And uh, these different brain may have different switching ability, I already showed you. Then, therefore, they should have different task performance for different uh, uh, quantitative uh, uh, ability. So therefore, we do this uh, structural equation modeling to associate the spring measure of segregation and the integration uh, to the quantitative ability. The ability here in this uh, uh, <clears throat> study, we consider like a 10 here, different tasks. And these different tasks from HCP 
I think it's a 991 subjects and uh, reflect different ability. This means like uh, this task one, two, three. Among these individual, their performance score are correlated. Why they are correlated? Because they reflect the same ability called the speed ability. And then through these different tasks, we can get a measure of uh, the speed ability of different individual. And then we have uh, for each individual, we have this HB, the balance, or also segregation or integration. Then you can see that uh, we indeed can find correlation or prediction about this pro the brain to the behavior. So you see uh, for the for the like a uh, uh, speed task here, speed task and the crystallized ability and the general ability, you see positive or negative correlation with um, <clears throat> with uh, the balance across the individual. But for the memory, we don't find a correlation. And then we actually also compare these uh, different measure to uh, uh, from graph theory measure, and uh, uh, we found out that our measure can better predict the ability. But while the memory couldn't have this linear prediction, so we said we saw that maybe according to the hypothesis, like some ability may be best at the balanced state. So therefore, we go to separate this uh, almost one thousand subject into three groups, and uh, you can have different threshold of this grouping. This is a more integrate. This is more segregate, and this is a, a balanced uh, group. And then we do this uh, uh, group structure equation modeling, and then you can find that, that indeed for those group with higher integration, they can do better in the general ability and uh, they will do worse in the uh, segregate, uh, in, in, in the crystallized or speed, because this different ability would require local more segregated processing. But for memory, we found that uh, the balance group is indeed is the best in the performance. <clears throat> so this is the summary of this uh, brief uh, presentation. We show that the brain structural and functional networks display hierarchical modular architecture, very pronounced uh, hierarchical modular organization. And these hierarchical modules based method can uh, be more powerful than the classical graph theory at the, to quantify segregation integration and balance because the graph theory just basing on the module at one level that our brain can actually use the module at different levels for processing. So resting state brain of young adults are on average close to a balanced state and then the individual difference of this uh, segregation integration or deviation from a balance then can predict different ability. And actually in this work, we show that uh, for those brain at resting state, like in the balanced state or in the segregated state, and uh, later will be more easier to switch to similar like uh, states with the particular task requirement. So that's all my uh, presentation. I thank you and also thank my uh, collaborators and the funding support. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for your introduction and the invitation. It's my great pleasure to participate in this conference. Today, I will talk about the synaptic correlates of working memory. Working memory refers to the short storage and manipulation of information for cognitive functions. There is hardly a cognitive task that does not involve working memory, including the visual processing, speech comprehension, and episodic memory. For the neural computing mechanism of working memory, Professor Mitasodis produced a synaptic theory. In his theory, he mainly considered the short-term plasticity effect. Short-term plasticity is a short-term effect of presynaptic firing on generating post-synaptic potential, and is widely found in various cortical regions. Short-term 
Plasticity includes two different parts. One is short-term facilitation, the other is short-term depression. When a spike arrives, the release probability U temporarily increases, resulting in the short-term facilitation effect. Meanwhile, the fraction of available neurotransmitters X decreases, resulting in the short-term depression effect. After neurofiring, so U returns to its, uh, its baseline uh, with a time constant to F, and X recovers to its maximum value uh, with a time constant of to D. The synaptic theory argues that memory is retained in the facilitated recurrent connections between neurons. For example, an external stimulus is loaded into working memory by activating the corresponding subpopulation of neurons. Afterwards, the neural population returns to the spontaneous state. And then, when a non-specific without signal is presented, it can selectively recall the memory items since the corresponding neural population has larger synaptic strengths. Today, I will talk about how to explain the underlying neural mechanism of the limited capacity and the manipulation of working memory by using the synaptic theory. For the capacity of working memory, physiological studies indicate that working memory capacity is limited. For example, in this experiment, subjects could only memorize uh, four different squares on the screen. This extremely low capacity uh, limits the exclusion of many cognitive tasks, but each neuron mechanism remains unknown. For the storage of multiple memory items, Professor Lisman proposed a hypothesis that the multiple memory items are stored in the nested theta and gamma oscillatory pattern and can be activated sequentially at different moments of time. Each memory is stored in a different high frequency uh, subcycle embedded in a low frequency frequency oscillation, and then the working memory capacity is estimated as a ratio of the gamma and theta frequencies. However, how the working memory capacity depends on the parameter of the model has uh, was not considered in the study. Based on the synaptic theory of working memory and the oscillatory view of multiple memory items, we aim to analytically estimate the maximum number of items that can be maintained in working memory. The advantage of the analytical expression is that it allows us to make prediction about how the working memory capacity depends on the various synaptic neuron and circuits parameters that can potentially be tested by the genetic manipulations. So here we consider a neural circuits model to implement working memory. The model consists of a number of neural clusters formed by excitatory neurons. Each excitatory cluster store, stores one memory item. A basic assumption of our model is that only one memory representation can be active at any single moment, which is guaranteed by the strong recurrent connections uh, between all the excitatory neural clusters and a global inhibitory neural pool. The inhibitory ne neural pool not only prevent explosive responses, but also introduce competition between all the excitatory clusters. To achieve an analytical estimation of working memory capacity, we drastically reduce the complexity of the network to only leave the most essential features that allow it to function as working memory, 
So we neglect the overlaps between the different neural clusters. The resulting network model have three different equations for each excitatory clusters and one additional equation for the inhibitory neuron pool. So here, tau is the time constant of the excitatory and inhibitory neural pool. IB is the background input, refers to the attentional uh, level of the network. IE is the external input, used to load the memory items into the network. U and X refers to the short-term facilitation and the short-term depression effect. Tau F and Tau D are the corresponding time constants. To illustrate the proposed mechanism, we simulated the network with parameters that are compatible with the experimental measurements in the prefrontal cortex. That is, the Tau F is much larger than Tau D. In this neural network model, with a strong enough arousal excitation, when four different memory items are loaded one by one by applying transient external excitation inputs to the corresponding clusters. After the removal of the external inputs, the corresponding neural clusters will generate the population spikes periodically in the same order as how they are loaded. And each cluster oscillates within the set band. We loaded five different items into the working memory and observed that four of them were maintained successfully in the form of the population spike. It means that for this set of parameters, the capacity is full. And then I will present how to theoretically analyze the working memory capacity. The maximum number of the items can be maintained in the working memory is determined by the ratio of two different factors. One is the maximum period of Tmax or the oscillatory activity of the network. The other one is the temporal separation between two consecutive population spikes refers to Ts. To estimate the Tmax, we note that a population spike is triggered by the intrinsic instability due to the recurrent excitations and is produced by the cluster that has the largest efficient recurrent strength. And thus, Tmax is the time uh, it takes for the synaptic efficacy, GUX, uh, to reach a pink. And it's chiefly determined uh, by the time constant of the synaptic depression. To estimate the TS, we divided it into three different parts and calculated them separately. And then the Tx is given by this equation. So combining the above the analysis, the working memory capacity can be estimated by this equation. From this equation, we know that firstly, the working memory capacity scales with the ratio uh, of two different time constant. One is the time constant of short-term depression effect. The other is the time constant of the excitatory neurons. Secondly, uh, the working memory capacity is controlled by the background excitation that should be above uh, the critical value below which no memory items can be maintained in working memory. To test the validity of the first conclusion, we simulated the network model with various choice of the short-term depression and short-term facilitation time constant and the synaptic uh, time constant tall. The numerical results show that our analytical 
uh, results um, prediction captures quantity quantitatively with the working memory capacity. To test the uh, second conclusion, we carried out simulation to check the probability of multiple items when the network are said to be different background inputs. Within large number of random initial conditions, we found that only when the arousal level is high enough, uh, multiple items can be memorized. With an increasing arousal level, the number of the memory items increases. So finally, I will summarize the neural mechanism of the limited uh, capacity of working memory. Working memory is maintained in the facilitated synaptic connection between neurons, and the short-term depression effect mainly determined the working memory capacity. For the manipulation of working memory, uh, temporarily storing a list of items in working memory, a fundamental ability in cognition, has been posited to rely on the temporal dynamics of the multiple item neural presentations during the maintaining period. However, the causal evidence, particularly in human subjects, is still leaking, let alone in working memory manipulation. My cooperator, Professor Luo from Peking University, developed a novel dynamic perturbation approach to manipulate the relative memory strengths of working items, mem working memory items held in our human brain. Specifically, previous study shows that the task irrelevant color features will be automatically bound to be the uh, memorized orientation feature in working memory when they are belonging to the same object. Therefore, by ma manipulating the ongoing temporal relationship between the continuous of uh, flaking color probes that are bound to each working memory items respectively, we could manipulate um, the memory strengths of the me multiple memory items so here we focus on the recency effect that is better memory performance for recently than earlier presented items, which is typically working memory behavior index to characterize the relative memory strengths of a sequence items. First, by applying the synchronized continuous flicking props input to the color props during retention, the recency effect um, is, the, is significantly disrupted. In contrast, the recency effect keeps when the flicking props are temporally uncorrelated. So secondly, when the uh, flicking color sequence of the props are temporarily shift, um, shifted with each other in an order that is either the same uh, or the reversed as the stimulus sequence. They lead to a distinct and even reversed uh, recency effect. That is, in the same order condition, the recency effect is enhanced while in the reversed condition, the recency effect is disrupted and even reversed to the significant primary effect. That is better memory performance for the earlier presented item. After confirming the effectiveness of the dynamic perturbation approach on working memory manipulation, we established a theoretical continuous attractor neural network model with short-term plasticity effect to mimic the dynamic perturbation experiments. 
The continuous attractor neural network model has been widely used to model the orientation tuning and the working memory related phenomenon. All excited green users in the, in the network model are aligned according to their preferred orientations and they are connected in a transitional invariant manner. All excited green neurons are connected to a common inhibitory neuron pool, which introduces the competition between the different memory items. By using the model of continuous structure network model and the short-term plasticity effect, we found that two orientation features are first sequentially loaded into the uh, network model and invoke two strong population spikes. So during the retention, the synaptic efficacy of the two memory-related neuron groups will not fall to the baseline immediately and could rather remain at high levels for a long time and decay slowly as a result of short plasticity. The synaptic efficacy determines the strength of the memory items and then the relative size uh, determines the recalling performance of the recency effect. The critical manipulation, the flaking uh, color probes are, are simulated as continuous input containing partial information of a memory a memorized item to the corresponding neural items uh, during the maintaining period. For the synchroni synchronization conditions, so the two neural groups continues to generate population spikes in the same order as they, as they are loaded, and their synaptic efficacies fluctuate with neural activities according to the certain plasticity, which gradually destroyed the initial uh, relative size of the synaptic current uh, efficacy between the two uh, neural groups. And thus, the effic recency uh, effect is largely uh, disrupted. And for the same order manipulation condition, the same order manipulation enhanced the relative value of the synaptic efficacy of the two neural groups. That is enlarging the difference of the synaptic efficacy, so finally leading to the enhanced recency effect. The reversal manipulation condition so this reversal manipulation keeps disrupting the relative value of the synaptic efficacy and gradually breaks their relationship. So this process will cause the reversed recency effect to primary effect. Therefore, the simulation results successfully uh, replicated all our experimental findings, further cooperating the neural mechanism for the working memory manipulation approach. Finally, I will summarize the manipulation mechanism of working memory. My cooperator developed a dynamic perturbation approach to manipulate the uh, relative strengths of a list of items in human working memory. I built um, up a computational model um, to reproduce all the experimental findings. So the model demonstrates that the dynamic perturbation introduced changes in the relative synaptic efficacies of memory items and finally cause the modulation of the working memory. So finally, I will uh, thank my cooperator, Professor Misha Sodis and Professor Ruo and uh, Dr. Li Jiaqi and uh, Huang Qiaoli. So thanks for your attention.
Um, hello, everyone. I'm Yun Liang uh, from Brandeis University. And today I'm going to talk about how uh, when neurons fire at high frequencies, how, new, uh, how sodium accumulation regulates the, availab uh, the reliability of spike propagation in axons. So uh, the brain only accounts for 2% of the body mass, but it consumes 20% of the body energy when humans are at rest. And a large part of the energy is spent on spike generation and propagation. So why spike generation and propagation consumes energy? Because the extracellular sodium concentration is higher than intracellular, um, than intracellular sodium concentration. So when the membrane potential reaches spike threshold, um, the sodium channels open and the, extra, uh, and the extracellular, extracellular sodium ions flows inside. So to maintain the gradient of sodium concentrations between the inter, uh, intercellular space and the extracellular space, the excess sodium ions needs to be pumped out by sodium potassium pumps, which consumes ATP. Uh, the process of pumping out sodium ions is well known, but rarely we can say that how this process may constrain or regulate the spiking reliability in neurons. Um, given the high energy cost in the brain, neuronal development may be subject to constraints from the limited energy supply. For example, it was found that a thick spike provides a smaller sodium influx compared with a thin spike. Uh, but to achieve high frequency spiking, neuronal spikes has to be narrow so that in this case, it can, uh, it can um, speed the recovery of sodium channel inactivation gate to decrease the refractory period, uh, but at the cost of a high energy cost. Uh, when neurons are only required to fire at low frequencies, uh, it, it was proposed that uh, their, firing, uh, their spikes are usually wider to decrease the single spike caused sodium influx to minimize single spike consumed energy. So later we will examine whether the message from this work holds in all conditions. So no matter what kind of spikes are generated in the, uh, in the soma or dendrites, they need to trans, uh, transmit to other neurons through axons. And axons have very different structural properties. Uh, they, uh, they can be mainly classified into two groups depending on whether they are myelinated or, or not. So in unmyelinated axons, axon cha uh, cha ion channels are distributed on the whole surface, and therefore spikes are generated and propagated through the whole axon like a wave. In contrast, myelinated axons are covered with myelin sheet, where no ion channels are distributed, and between uh, between myelin sheath and nodes of runway, where our ion channels are clustered. Uh, therefore, in uh, uh, myelinated axon, uh, uh, spikes propagate in a saltatory way. So you can imagine during spike propagation, the sodium influx and removal patterns in this two different type of, of axons will be very different. Additionally, axon structures also show differ uh, differences in diameter, branching patterns, and the ion channel distributions, etc. Um, as to accent diameters, they vary a lot between different uh, neuronal types. And surprisingly, a positive correlation has been found in previous studies between the accent diameter and the fire and neuronal maximal firing frequency. Uh, this is surprising because if reducing energy expenditure is the if the constraint of a uh, constraint of neuronal development, high frequency spikes should tend to occur in thin axons. But why do they occur in thick axons instead? So, is there any, any other uh, constraint that we ignored previously? So, to solve the questions, we use axon models to explore how diameter, myelination, sodium potassium pump density, and the ion channel uh, kinetics interact to regulate the accidental reliability of propagating high-frequency spikes. Uh, first, our work is based on the premise that the process of sodium ions pumping out by sodium potassium pump is a slow process, 
and which is supported by experiment data. The left is from C1 parameter neurons. Uh, we can see the it we can see it takes tens of seconds for the elevated sodium concentration to decay to the baseline level. The right is from the right is from the snail neuron. Initially, the authors applied potassium-free solution to block sodium potassium pumps to increase intracellular sodium concentration. And then they applied normal extracellular solution to resume the pump function. We can see uh, it takes minutes for the elevated sodium concentration to recover to the baseline level. According to their different structures, the left is the myelinated oxygen model and the right is the myelinated oxygen model. Uh, they both are 3031 micrometer long. Uh, in the myelinated oxygen model, the ion channels and the pumps are distributed on the whole surface. In contrast, in the, myel uh, the myelinated oxygen is mainly covered with interspaced myelin sheath. Uh, and the myelin sheath are uh, each of the myelin sheath is one, 100 micrometer long, and between the myelin sheath are nodes of runway, which are one micrometer long. The ion channels and the pumps are, uh, distrib are clustered at nodes of runway, but not on myelinated compartments. Uh, in this model, we try to keep the model minimal, and therefore we only incorporate sodium, KD, KA, and the lead current. We consider the sodium diffusion in the longitudinal direction and the radial direction. Because the, the, axons are uh, the axon diameters are small compared with uh, the large diffu uh, diffusion coefficient, and therefore after spiking, uh, spike caused sodium rise uh, quickly reaches equilibrium in the radial direction. And therefore we use the sodium concentration in the outermost shell to represent the, in uh, the intracellular sodium concentration. Um, this is a a deterministic model and the spikes are triggered by electrical stimulus. We use neuron to uh, do the modeling. And here shows one uh, example spike waveform from the unmyelinated axon. And here is the um, uh, ion, cap ion currents in the model. And we can see the sodium potassium pump current is much smaller compared with other currents, but it doesn't decay significantly after spiking. So here we explore how a single spike can change the intracellular sodium concentration. So uh, after spiking, uh, sodium concentration rise quickly in both models. Uh, in the myelinated axon model, uh, it takes a, a relatively long time for the elevated sodium concentration to recover to the baseline level. Uh, but in myelinated axons, it takes only less than one second. The ion channels and the pump densities are identical in the two models, and therefore it's obvious that the quick decay is not a result of the super efficient pump activity. We have mentioned the ion channels are only distributed at uh, nodes of runway, and therefore the ions flows in the, uh, into the axon only through the node of runway. And the myelinated compartment uh, functions like uh, becomes the, the sink for the nodal sodium influx and therefore cause a quick, de a quick decay. This can also be seen by the slightly elevated sodium concentration in the elevated sodium uh, in, the, uh, in the myelinated compartment. Um, spike cause sodium elevation is determined by the surface volume ratio, which is inverse of the diameter. In other words, spike caused sodium elevation decrease with axon uh, diameters. We also tested the effect of increasing pump density, which doesn't change the sodium, uh, the sodium elevation peak. Uh, increased pump density speeds, uh, speeds pumping sodium ions out of the axon and therefore causing a, quick, uh, a quicker decay of sodium concentration in the unmyelinated axon. However, it nearly has no effect on the myelinated axon because in myelinated axon model, the quick decay is a result of axial sodium diffusion rather than sodium, sodium ions being pumped out. So in, previous, in the previous slide, we ex explored how a, single, how a single spike can change the intracellular sodium concentration. 
And compared with the basal level sodium concentration, the change is really small. Uh, neuronal firing frequency is not fixed. They, uh, they can be varied to encode behavior-related uh, tasks. And so how does intracellular sodium concentration change when neurons fire at high frequencies? Uh, we can see in uh, myelinated axons, the sodium significantly accumulates when, they, when neurons fire at high frequencies because of the slower process of uh, sodium ions being pumped out. And the accumulation speed is faster in thin axons because the spike caused the sodium elevation is inversely proportional to the diameter. And the accumulation speed increases with the firing frequency. So with the, uh, with the accumulation of sodium ions, the reversal potential, i.e. the driving force of sodium current also decreases accordingly, which subsequently decreases the spike amplitude. And when the uh, firing frequency is above some, uh, some value, the reduced sodium current, together with the reduced, reduced recovery of sodium channel inactivation gate, caused the spike propagation to fail. And, um, and also note that in unmyelinated axons, um, sodium accumulates very fast. It only takes about 100 spikes to observe the, uh, the pronounced sodium accumulation and the propagation failure to occur. And then what about in myelinated compartment, myelinated axons? So sodium still accumulates in myelinated axons, despite of the seemingly, seemingly quick decay of sodium, sodium concentration. And look at the inset. Uh, it shows an expanded view of uh, uh, sodium concentration rise and decay at a node of runway and its neighboring myelinated compar uh, compartment. We can see the quick decay is only a result of sodium redistribution rather than so uh, sodium ions being pumped out. And therefore, sodium, uh, sodium still accumulates, but at a much sl slower speed. So it takes thousands of spikes to observe the pronounced sodium accumulation and the spike propagation. So in the model, the propagation failure show complicated patterns. And here we use interspike interval to show the propagation failure patterns. So if the interspike interval is fixed and equivalent to the simulation interval, that means the propagation doesn't fail, as shown uh, by the interspike intervals before one second. However, the accumulated sodium gradually caused the propagation uh, failure to occur. And once propagation fails, in this example, we can see every other spike failed to propagate. In, in the second example, more complicated propagation failure patterns are shown though. So um, the above, uh, in the above plus, the colors code uh, accent diameters and the point and the dot corresponding to the model with the baseline pump density. And the star represents uh, uh, models with uh, 10 times larger pump densities. So we can see increasing pump density consistently alleviated the sodium accumulation in both a myelinated axon model and the myelinated axon model. And next, we measured how many spikes are required to trigger the propagation failure to measure the re reliability of spike propagation or the axonal resilience to high frequency spiking. So as expected, thick axons are more resilient uh, to high frequency spiking compared with thin spikes. And the resilience increase with pump density, but decrease with firing frequency. In the myelinated axon models, it takes tens of thousands of spikes to, uh, uh, to observe the propagation failure compared with hundreds of spikes in the myelinated axon model. And the absence of data points just means the failure doesn't occur and the corresponding conditions. So now we can answer the questions raised in the beginning. So why uh, high frequency spiking occurs in thick axons rather than in thin axons? Because in thick axons, sodium accumulates slowly and their reliability of propagating high frequency spikes is high. 
in this work, we explored sodium, sodium accumulation caused uh, neuronal excitability reduction and propagation failure. Um, let's recall in the beginning of this talk, we mentioned neurons may change their uh, kinetic properties or spike properties to meet their spiking functions. So here, we change the potassium current activation time constant to explore how it affects spike caused sodium influx and the reliability of uh, spike propagation. So um, we use C to represent our control model. And we change the potassium current activation time constant in the range of uh, 0 0.4 to uh, 0 0.2 to 1.4 times of this value. And we can see uh, slowing uh, potassium current activation consistently widens the spikes. And according to this previous result, uh, uh, research, that means the spike caused sodium influx should decrease monotonically. But in our work, we can see it only decreases from A to B, but it starts to increase from B to D. And in addition to this U-shaped uh, uh, sodium influx changes, spike widening also, also caused complicated effects on the spike propagation. On the one hand, spike widening increases the axial charge that can uh, depolarize neighboring compartments to facilitate the, the to facilitate the spike propagation. On the other hand, it reduces the recovery of sodium channel inactivation gate to increase the refractory period to oppose the spike propagation. So here, let's explore how uh, spike widening uh, affects the axonal uh, propagation of high frequency spikes. Here we still use the number of spikes required to cause uh, sp spike propagation failure. Given the complicated changes of sodium influx, the axial change, and the recovery from the sodium inactivation gate, we can see spike widening caused complicated effects on the uh, spike propagation reliability. So the reliability increased from A to B, but it decreased from B to C. So to summarize, thick axons are more resilient to high frequency spiking because of slower sodium accumulation. And the myelinate uh, compartments function like anti-flood water reservoir to slow sodium accumulation and increase the spike propagation reliability. And in, in different neurons with different parameter sets, they may need different strategies to improve the axonal propagation reliability. And this work was just recently published in uh, PNAS. And you can find the code of this work uh, from ModelDB. Um, here, uh, first, I would like to thank, uh, thank Eve, um, who gave me tremendous support in her lab, and my colleagues, who helped me a lot in both uh, life and research. And finally, uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, Professor, to give me the opportunity to share our recent work about the special temporal dynamical modeling of Emerson seizures. We are using new field theory of a particle autonomic system. So I have been working with Pro Professor Peter Robinson in the University of Sydney, and he has spent more than 20 years to establish the framework of a post-cut model of working memory, uh, working brain. And the frameworks include uh, cortex solomus and the brain stem and hypothalamus. So in this framework, the cortex is simplified as a 2D physical sheet. And the 2D physical sheet interacts with the solomus by the long range axon projection. So the, the cortical solomus system is in a time scale of a second. And today, this talk is to focus on this. Uh, cortical sonic system. And this system can describe many phenomena in the brain, like the re responses to the stimuli, thermal circadian drives, as well as the arousal states. And it can reproduce many signals, features, such as, such as the EEG, FMI, ECOG, and LLP signals. And this framework 
incorporates the simple behavior of feedbacks, like the non photo stimuli of wax sleep transitions. So, this framework can be as a starting point for further development with the integration and the unification. So, the model describes this system in a mean field style. So, the neural population activity is, is characterized by the mean potential of the neural population, which will determine its mean fire rate. And this uh, neural activity will generate the activity field sent to the post-synaptic neural population. And this model has a feature that the activity feature can be detected by the um, EEG technology and also, as well as other technologies. So this model can describe the underlying basic uh, interactions as well as the signals can, which can be detected in the reality. So the model includes the excitatory population, inhibitor population in the cortex, as well as the particular nucleus and relay nucleus in the thalamus. And the interaction between the cortex and the thalamus has a time delay TB. So the model can produce many phenomena in the EEG signals, such as the full range power spectrum, as well as the time series uh, features when the brain in the different states, like the e eyes open, eyes closed, normal sleep, and deep sleep, as well as the model can describe the signal of ERP. So the model has several parameters, which can be ranked into three uh, basic parameters, such as the cortical interaction, solomical interaction, and the cortical solomical interactions. And under this tent, the brain is in a stable state. So it's a, it's a normal state, state like the uh, eye open, eye closed, and sleep stage. But beyond this tent, the brain state is unstable, which can be related to the tissue activity. Which, uh, and I will talk about this unstable activity in this talk. So let, let me first introduce the homogeneous case, which corresponds to the global mode instability. So this is a, the typical absence seizure EEG signals with a generalized 2 to 3 hertz spike wave discharges. And this is an, another one, which is gradually increased, uh, which has a gradually increased amplitude at the onset of a tissue activity. And this indicates a supercritical hop application to generalize the spike wave discharges. And this model can be used to model uh, to capture many nonlinear features in the EEC signals of absence tissue tissue activity. And we, we can find that uh, this absence seizure is induced by the underlying cortical solomon cortical loop resonance. So from the cortex signal to the reticular nuclear and to the relay nuclear and come back to the cortex. <coughs> the model can also describe the conical clonical seizures. And these two types of seizures has many different properties, like the duration, onset frequency, and EEG before and after seizures, as well as the waveforms in the seizure activity, as well as the cognitive function impairment. And all of these properties point to there are different two different types of hop application for these dynamics. So the supercritical hop application for the absence seizure and the subcritical hop application for the conic clonic seizure. And my question is, how are these how publication properties relate to the frequencies of seizure onset. And fortunately, there's a well-established theory, the critical known form of how publication can be used to describe these two types of how publications. So there's a, um, only one parameter can separate these two types. So when C is negative, that is the supercritical how publication, and when C is positive, that is the subcritical hop application. And I will try to establish the link 
between the with all this code based cortical tolerance system to this uh, critical node form, which is the simplified dynamical system. So at the first stage, we derived the characteristic equation for Hopper equations. And the loop resonance is determined by the synaptal density field, cortical loop, solomical loop, as well as the cortical solomical loop. And then we can derive the critical null form of the whole applications. And we get the only one parameter C1. So C1 is a complex number, and its real part will determine the types of whole applications. And the interesting thing is that C1 can be fully determined by two families of functions, the transfer functions and the sensitivity functions. And what are they? So as we know, at the critical point, the system has a, has one free variables. And then we can set the uh, activity field generated by the statutory population as a exponential function of time. And then the damping effect from the statutory population can be eliminated. And then we can get the reduced open loop for this critical dynamics. And, and then we can write down these two families of functions, the strength function and the sensitivity functions. So in this, in this work, we love the critical normal form of hope application to, the, to, to uh, characterize uh, the two types of absence, uh, two types of, of seizures, the absence seizure and the tonic clonic seizures. And uh, this normal form can only can be expressed in terms of only the strength function and the sensitivity functions of a, of a reduced open loop. So the, the normal form can be applied to study other dynamical mechanism of harmonic and subharmonic activities in the SSVEP as well as the photosensitivity and the visually induced seizures. So now we, I, I come to introduce another case, the heterogeneous case, which corresponds to the special temporal instability. So people try to understand the fundamental mechanisms underlying generalized spike wave discharge associated, associated with the absence issues. So the solemnus and the cortex have attracted the most of the attention from both the clinical and the experimental researches. But they have different and conflicting interpretations. So in the genetic load and model, the absence with generalized x spike wave discharges have uh, the similar, a similar pharmacology profiles with the human absence issues. But uh, they have only one difference, the frequency it, uh, of spike wave discharge is different. That is uh, 7 to 11 hertz in a rodent and the 2 to 4 hertz in other animals like cats, rats, monkeys, or humans. And this difference has been explained by Alex in 1998. They proposed the burst rebound due to low threshold calcium current so-called T-type calcium current. And it will induce, it will induce the graph B uh, trans transmitters to account for the uh, faster frequency and the uh, lower, lower frequency in different animals, like this one. So they can account for different frequencies. But the, this proposal is challenged in recent years. In the uh, in vivo it experiment, so they found there's a rare T type channel dependent boost firing in a C activity. There are only tonic uh, firing in the C activity. So in their paper, they concluded that a T boosting firing do not determine a spike wave discharge frequency, and the synaptic garbage receptor do not determine the spike wave discharge frequency. 
on the other hand, uh, I have noticed that the social activity in the lowland is not generalized. It's, it has a, a focal region, and the social activity is decayed to the tail. And this phenomenon is also confirmed in the fMRI signals. There is a focal uh, region for the absence issues. It's also confirmed in the uh, mRNA expression uh, in a rodent model. So there's a, a focal uh, high expression of mRNA in the CC activity, for the CC activity. So my motivation is we try to unify, unify the global and the focal aspects of everything CC. And uh, we will try to under, uh, answer whether the higher frequency spike wave discharge in genetic rodent model can be accounted for due to the smaller special extent of focal seizures. So our method is <laughs> to explore the conditions of focal activity to be expressed or to remain localized or to uh, generalized and spread over the whole brain. So we are using the new field theory to study the special temporal dynamics of the cortical sonic system with focal special heterogeneity. So this is our model setting with a seizure focus in the center with a characteristic seizure width, sigma. And we also can see the characteristic axon range. So in the simulation, we found in the phase diagram of the sigma and the IE, we found uh, six phases, six different dynamical phases. So when sigma is small, the seizure y is small, and then the seizure can be expressed by the normal region. But when the seizure region is large enough, then the seizure can spread out over the whole brain. But in between, there are an interesting region, the seizure activity can be localized, but with higher frequency. And it can be induced, and it can induce a very complicated uh, seizure activity, like a chaotic activity. So this is the six different uh, uh, phase in, in the phase diagram. So in the, uh, for the localized seizure activity, it can be regular high frequency oscillation in the, and uh, as well as the chaotic activity in, in the, uh, for the localized seizure activity. And we are trying, we are trying, to, trying to understand what is the underlying dynamical mechanism. So we do the linear stability analysis. And we get the eigenvalue special for this system. And we found uh, there are two branches eigenvalues. So one is corresponding to this loop, uh, underlying loop resonance in the cortical solenoid system. And another one is due to the another loop resonance. But we have noticed that there's one more eigenvalue here is beyond the underlying cortical solenoid loop resonance. So it's due to the special temporal interaction. So we can get the localized seizure activity with a higher frequency. It's an immersion special temporal dynamics, rather than the resonance of the underlying cortical along the loops. And the least uh, immersions has a special eigen mode. For the localized seizure activity, the uh, seizure activity is oscillating uh, constrained by the uh, profiles of the static state. But for the seizure uh, generalization, the activity can spread out over the whole brain. And then what is the condition for the emotions of the localized seizure activity? We found it's due to the strong nonlinear effect in the focal seizure. So when the focal seizure has a uh, uh, higher enough or stronger enough nonlinearity, it can induce such kind of uh, localized seizure activity.
And we will also predict the phase of philosophy for both the seizure, uh, localized seizure activity and the generalized seizure activity, which can be further checked in the, in the, in the data. So in this work, we studied the, the cortical polymer system, uh, system, which is a focal special heterogeneity. And we studied the condition when the focal seizure activity can be suppressed or can be uh, localized or generalized to the whole brain. So we found that the localized seizure activity is induced by the special temporal interactions uh, of the focal seizure region with the normal region. And which it will, depends on the, uh, the focal width as well as the axon range. So, such a, so this kind of emergent special temporal dynamics of seizure localization can count for a higher frequency in the genetic low dent model with the focal spike wave discharges of absent seizures. So we provide a new physical explanations of especially more localized waves with higher oscillating frequencies. Okay, that's all. Thanks for your attention.